Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the event will begin now. Yambar Usaha, Mr. Harizal Hazri, Chief Executive, ISIS Malaysia. Yambar Bahagia, Datin Paduka, Dr. Farida Abdullah, Chairman, the NOAA Foundation. Yambar Bahagia, Datuk Muhammad Riza Ghazi, Representative of the late Tun Hussein's family. Yambar Bahagia, Emeritus Professor, Datuk Haji Shad Salim Faruqi, Holder of the Tun Hussein Chair in International Studies, ISIS Malaysia. Yambar Bahagia, Tan Sri Sulaiman Mahbub, Member of the Board, Excellencies, Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the lecture series returning to the Constitution's path of moderation and the launch of the publication titled Multiculturalism and Nation Building in a Plural and Divided Society, The Case of Malaysia. To begin this morning's program, I would like to invite Yambaru Sahar Mr. Harizal Hazri, Chief Executive of ISIS Malaysia, to deliver his welcoming remarks. Thank you very much, Farlina. Assalamualaikum and good morning. Yang berbahagia, Datin Paduka Dr. Farida Abdullah, Chairman, the NOAA Foundation. Yang berbahagia, Datuk Muhammad Riza Ghazi, representative of the late Tun Hussein Ons family. Yang berbahagia, our honoured guests, Emeritus Professor Datuk Dr. Haji Shad Salim Faruqi, uh, the holder, the fourth holder of the Tun Hussein Ons Chair in International Studies at ISIS, Tansri Sulaiman Mahbub, member of our board, excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Like my previous colleagues, I have the honor this morning to host the Don Hussein On Chair public lecture. Uh, but before we dive deep into that and allow uh, Prof Shad to deliver his lecture, I'd like to first introduce the Don Hussein On Chair to all the participants this morning. The Tun Hussein On Chair seeks to memorialize the legacy of the late Tun Hussein On by producing policy relevant studies and papers on nation building and how Malaysia can advance its interests in ASEAN and the world and on regional and global strategic dynamics that impact our beloved nation, Malaysia. The chair has contributed towards the development of Malaysian and international studies and improved the country's research capacity in these fields. This enhanced the capacity and deeper knowledge that will enable greater appreciation of the complex forces that shape nations and the international system. The chair was established in 2012 with a gracious sponsorship by the NOAA Foundation. And the previous holders of the Tun Hussein On Chair have been Dato Dr. Mutia Alagapa, the first chair, Professor Anthony Milner, the second chair, Professor Jomo Kwame Sundaram, the third chair, and we have the fourth chair, Emeritus Professor Dato Dr. Shad Salim Faruqi. Each of these distinguished gentlemen have brought their expertise to bear on key issues affecting our nation, thus enriching the academic and policy discourse in the country while building the capacity of key institutions, including ISIS Malaysia. I'd like to take this opportunity also to mention that without the general support of the NOAA Foundation, we probably would not have this chair set up in the first place. So I'd like to acknowledge then that, and I think it is very important that Malaysians play a role in developing uh, these key areas of study really for the future of our country. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I don't intend to speak too long, but it will be unfair if I don't introduce uh, Prof Emeritus Professor Dr. Dr. Shad. Um, Dr. Dr. Shad is, as everybody knows, is uh, one of the most um, um, specialists, I would say, in the area of constitution in our country. Uh, but to me, what is more important is that uh, Prof Emeritus Professor Dr. Dr. Shad has been a dear friend and has, I have known him for many years, in fact, even before I joined ISIS. Um, so I have a lot to say about uh, Prof Shad, but unfortunately, if I do that, uh, we'll probably not have enough time for the lecture this morning. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mention a few key things about Prof Shad, and then I'm going to give it back to you, Falina. Professor Emeritus Dr. Dr. Shad Salim Faruqi was the force, as, as we all know, holder of the Tun Hussein On Chair, in international studies at ISIS, and that was from 2019 to 2021. He
He is currently the holder of the Tunku Abdurrahman Chair at the Faculty of Law, University of Malaya, Fellow of the Academy of Sciences Malaysia, Professor Emeritus at University Technology Mara Shah Alam, and adjunct professor at Taylor's University. He was a member of the Judicial Appointments Commission from 2018 to 2020, member of the post general election 14 government's institutional reform committee and member of the malaysia agreement 1963 committee from 2018 to 2020 he has also served as visiting professor at university of science malaysia penang associate professor at university of islam antarabangsa malaysia and adjunct professor at the new england university of australia he has authored 11 books and published more than 600 articles in journal periodicals and newspapers has done many national and international consultancies. Many of them has given great impact, not just to Malaysia, as well as to other countries in the region, including the drafting of the constitution of the Republic of Maldives in 1992. Now with that, ladies and gentlemen, I hand this back to Falina, and I hope everybody will enjoy this morning's lecture. Thank you very much, and assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much, Mr. Harizal. With great pleasure, I now invite Yang Bahagir, Datuk Muhammad Rizal Ghazi, representative of the late Tun Hosseinan's family, to give his remarks. Thank you very much, Farlina. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera and a very good morning. Yang berusaha, Saudara Rizal Hazri, Chief Executive of ISIS Malaysia, Yang berbahagia Datin Paduka Dr. Farida Abdullah, Chairman of the Dua Foundation. Yang berbahagia Emeritus Professor Datuk Dr. Haji Shah Salim Paruki, Tun Hussein On Chair in International Studies at ISIS Malaysia. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is my honor and privilege to represent the family of my late grandfather Tun Hussein On at today's public lecture by Professor Shah. At this juncture, allow me to record my deepest gratitude to Noah Foundation and ISIS Malaysia for honoring the memory of my late grandfather through the Tun Hussein On Chair. Two years have passed since Professor Shah was appointed the fourth holder of the Tun Hussein, uh, Tun Hussein On Chair at ISIS Malaysia. In, this, in those two years, he has been prolific, delivering forums, lectures, and now this monograph. We are indeed lucky to have an intellect such as Prof Shah, who is devoted in the study of public law and in turn making this document of destiny accessible to one and all through his tireless efforts. Despite the difficulties and the situation of working under pandemic conditions, Prof Shah rose to the challenge and produced work of a stellar standard. Next year will be the centenary of the birth of my late grandfather. The family is moved to see that Prof Shah has done much justice to my late grandfather's legacy of unity and compassionate justice. Ladies and gentlemen, Malaysia's constitution is notable because of the level of detail that it has gone into it. We came into being as a nation of in circumstances that were less than ideal. A population or language, religion and race, a communist insurgency, the Cold War, However, somehow, we forged ahead to make this work. We have endowed with certain difficulties right from the very beginning. And in this monograph, Professor Shard outlines how and why accommodations were made to make this country work. Even today, there are parties with complaints and questions about certain aspects of the Constitution. And that is all right. What is key is understanding the birth of this, con this document the conditions present in the then lesson Malaysia and why it took the form it did, how it brought about stability and unit, uni, uh, unity in diversity. The birth in the, of the constitution, the spirit of law, rule of law, multiculturalism, and the unflinching hope of one's fledging nation is remarkable in how it saw a population come together and make compromises for the greater good. It remains a document that forms the cornerstone of governance, policy, and moderation, values my family hold close. Ladies and gentlemen, with the challenges placed by COVID-19 
COVID-19 upon Malaysia as a whole, it is even more important that we embrace our shared destiny. As the learned Prof Shah puts it, we all have a role to play in strengthening ethnic bridges, restoring moderation, and recapturing the spirit of 1957. Malaysia's strength has, for all of its existence, been a melting pot of cultures and ethnicities coming together to make the nation a success. The pandemic has thrown many challenges in our way, economic hardship, isolation through the lockdowns, and of course, the loss of loved ones. However, throughout these ordeals, we must remember not to lose sight of what is important, our biggest asset, which is our diversity. At this crucial juncture in Malaysia's history, we are in some ways privileged enough to receive first-hand lesson in nation building for the future. We can truly embrace the principles of our forefathers, out of many, one, and embrace pluralism, diversity, compassion. Of course, there will be conflict. There will always be conflict along the road of any goal worth achieving. However, what is important is to solve these conflicts in a level-headed and conciliatory fashion. In his monograph, Professor Shah urges us to build bridges, not walls. These are truly words to take to heart. We can focus on uplifting communities in a positive manner rather than allowing the specters of racism and hatred seize control of our motivations. Professor Shah cleverly navigates the tricky waters of the post merdeka generation, generation's views, particularly the watering down of the spirit of moderation in society and obsession, as he puts it, with what divides us rather than a focus on what unites us. In the past 18 months, we have seen tensions arise. Society become restive due to external challenges. Be that as it may, we have also seen the best in our society. Initiatives to help each other during these difficult times. Communities have transcended racial and religious lines to the extent of assisting to one, giving assistance to one another. That is the Malaysia Prof Shah and my late grandfather in vision. That is the Malaysia that the constitution in many ways herald. Ladies and gentlemen, I am drawn a lot from this monograph myself. As a practicing lawyer, I'm used to the flowery, sometimes ostentatious language used by senior members of both the bench and the bar. The beauty of this monograph is its accessibility language that anyone can digest, mull over, and learn from. I sincerely hope that this monograph will be widely read, not just by academics, but also students, activists, lawyers, and members of the ordinary public. Constitutional fluency is an important trait in, of an educated, empowered society. A lack of constitutional literacy means that citizens are unable to properly perceive the building blocks of their own nation and the balance between rights and responsibilities. Perhaps to seize on the momentum of this monograph launch, ISIS Malaysia can partner with Prof Shah to organize more lectures and training on the constitution and its all important role as the supreme law of the land. I look forward to Professor Shah's lecture and the publication of this important monograph. The family of the late Tan Sri Noah and late Tun Hussein On are indeed very proud to be associated with this important work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yang Berbahagia Datuk Muhammad Riza. We move this morning's program to the launch of the monograph, Multiculturalism and Nation Building in a Plural and Divided Society, the Case of Malaysia. To begin, I would now like to invite Yang Berbahagia Emeritus Professor Datuk Dr. Haji Shad Salim Faruqi, fourth holder of the Tun Hussein On Chair of International Studies at ISIS Malaysia, to introduce his book and share some thoughts with us. Yamba Bahagia Meritus Professor, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Farlena. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. May peace be upon you all. Yamba Bahagia Datin Paduka, Dr. Farida Abdullah, uh, Yang Berusaha. And Chaharizal Hazri, Chief Executive ISIS, 
yang ISIS Malaysia, yang berbahagia Datuk Muhammad Rizal Ghazi, Tan Sri Sulaiman, Excellencies, Distinguished Participants, Good Morning, Ni Hao, Wanakam, Namaste, Sat Sariakal, Nuno Habar, Apa Cita Te. I hope I have been inclusive enough. <laughs> um, I'm deeply grateful to the NOAA Foundation and to ISIS Malaysia for this great honor. Thank you so much. It adds a warm glow to the colors of my sunset. I also thank Dr. Dato Riza for beautifully summarizing what I have to say and what I hold close to my heart. I'm also close to Joanne and her team at ISIS for the expert editing and designing of this monograph. I had nothing to do with the design. So if you like it, uh, it's all ISIS's uh, uh, credit. This monograph is about our constitution, our document of destiny, as I like to call it. I sincerely believe that the Merdeka constitution was a masterpiece of moderation, compassion and compromise. The spirit that animated it was one of accommodation between the Malay majority and the non-Malay minorities on their mutual rights and privileges in a democratic, monarchical, federal and non-theocratic system of government. A middle path of moderation is clearly evident. If we examine the constitution in relation to the granting of citizenship without consideration of race or religion, the attempted balancing of the special position of the Malays with the legitimate interests of other communities, the recognition of religious, cultural and linguistic pluralism and, and the right to education for all. Instead of creating a melting pot, Malaysia painstakingly weaved a rich cultural mosaic. The plurality of lifestyles engendered gave rise to an extraordinary multifaceted society that supplied a model to many other diverse regions of the world. Indeed, for many, many decades, Malaysia was a, an exemplar for much of Asia and Africa on harmonious intercommunal relationships. In 1963, the special position of Sabah and Sarawak in the federal setup gave to pluralism a territorial dimension. But sadly, as is the fate of all social bargains, once the original authors pass from the scene, the descendants do not always appreciate the rationale behind the original compromises. Later governments, have to walk the tightrope between the need to honor the pact, the past, and to accommodate the demands and expectations of the new voters in an electoral democracy. The Malaysian constitution is undergoing such a process of readjustment and reinterpretation. There is a lively and inconclusive debate about what the document of destiny actually ordained and how far the imperatives of the constitution should be modified or reinterpreted to meet the new aspirations of the present generation. The problem is made worse by a general lack of constitutional literacy and even greater lack of constitutional patriotism within the population 
and within the political and administrative elite. In many areas, politics and administrative policy have trumped and displaced the constitution. For example, the debate about whether Malaysia is an Islamic or secular state is largely a political shadow play. No one familiar with the original constitutional papers will deny that a theocratic state was never in contemplation, nor was American style secularism desired or considered desirable. Malaya, later Malaysia, sought to walk the middle path. The state should not be indifferent to or hostile towards religions as it is in many other countries. The state must promote tolerance that comes not from the absence of faith, but from its living presence. This imperative of moderation was even more apparent when Sabah Sarawak Singapore were invited to federate with Malaya to create a new enlarged and even more diverse nation than in 1957. However, after the 1969 racial rights, the Malay features of the constitution were enhanced. Since the 1990s, Islamic dimension of the constitution has gained great prominence. Religious assertiveness and extremism on both sides of the divide are apparent on many issues. Since 1969, racialism and religious bigotry have become mainstream. The bigots in all communities are relying on fears to fan hatred. Moderates, who probably may be in a majority, but we do not know. Moderates are maligned as traitors to their race or religion. And so most of them prefer to remain quiet and live in the shadows. None of this is, of course, exclusive to Malaysia. No nation in the world is free of such problems. Maintaining peace and harmony, engineering social justice, and strengthening national unity in plural and divided societies poses special challenges everywhere. In some nations, the melting pot ideology is employed. In others, the model of a mosaic is adopted. Malaya, 1957, and Malaysia, 1963, settled for the mosaic approach. Let us keep it that way. Though dark clouds loom on the horizon to challenge national unity, I believe we have decades of experience in living together in peace and harmony. Though we have regressed, we can recapture what our forefathers so painstakingly helped to establish. This monograph seeks to provide the constitutional basis for moderation and accommodation. It is about what you and I as citizens can do to tear down the walls of separation and rebuild bridges of understanding. It is premised on the assumption that the greatness of a nation and the quality of its civilization are based not so much on military power or territorial conquests, but on the ability to live together in peace, harmony, and mutual respect, mutual respect with fellow human beings on this big blue marble we call the earth. Thank you again to NOHA Foundation and ISIS for the launch of this simple, humble, but sincere effort at finding the constitutional basis for national unity. Thank you very much and salamu alaikum. Thank you, Professor Shad. We will now proceed to the book launch and group photo session. We ask for our distinguished role players to switch your cameras on 
and adopt the official virtual background for the photo session. Should you have received the book, we invite our, we invite our role players to hold up the book for the photo session. Passing it over to our IT for the photography. So one, two, three, okay. and we're just going to take another one. So one, two, three, that should be all right. Thank you, distinguished guests and panelists. That concludes the launch of the book, Multiculturalism and Nation Building in a Plural and Divided Society, The Case of Malaysia. We will now move this morning's program to the lecture series on returning to the Constitution's path of moderation. The lecture will be delivered by Yang Babahagia Emeritus Professor, Dr. Dr. Haji Shad Salim Faruqi. Turning the session over to the panel, I would like to invite Mr. Alizan Mahadi, Senior Director of Research ISIS Malaysia to moderate this session. Mr. Alizan, you have the floor. Thank you, Farina. Yang berbahagia, Datin Paduka Dr. Farida Abdullah, Chairman of the North Foundation. Yang berusaha, Mr. Harizal Hazri, Chief Executive of ISIS Malaysia. Yang berbahagia, Datuk Muhammad Rizal Ghazi, Representative of the latest Tonus and Ons family. Yang berbahagia, Emeritus Professor Datuk Dr. Haji Shad Salim Faruqi. Yang berbahagia, Tansi Dr. Sulaiman Mahbub, Members of the Board, Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, Assalamualaikum, Salam Sejahtera, and a very good morning. My name is Azan Mahadi. I'm the Senior Director at ISIS Malaysia, and I have the honor of being the moderator for Meritus Professor Dr. Dr. Shad's lecture on returning to the Constitution's path of moderation. For your information, the Tony Hussein on Chairs, past and present, provide a series of lectures during the time of holding the position of chair. I have been told that this is Professor Shad's 11th lecture since 20, 2019 as the fourth holder of Tony Hussein on Chair. Thank you, Prof. Shad, for providing uh, such a number of, of lectures that have enlightened us uh, previously. This particular lecture is special as it is also in conjunction with the launching of his monograph that was launched just now. Before we begin, allow me to briefly describe the format of today's event. Emeritus Professor Shad will, will have around 40 minutes to make his initial remarks, and then we will aim for about 45 minutes of Q&A. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A function on your, on your Zoom uh, and write down your questions as clearly as possible. Please do keep the questions relevant to the topic of today's lecture. My co-moderator, Ms. Tashini Sukumaran, will then select and compile some of the questions and cue Professor Shah to respond to those questions. We prefer the Q&A function, uh, but if you have some burning questions, we may open up some questions to be asked verbally. We aim to adjourn the session uh, at 12.30 p.m. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, as we have heard, one of the defining characteristics of Malaysia, both in reality as well as in terms of narrative, is its diversity. Diversity not only in terms of ethnicity, but also in terms of religion, in terms of regions, in terms of urban and rural, rural dichotomy, and so on. This is, of course, one of the strengths of Malaysia, but governing a multicultural society, of course, comes with its challenges. Yes. In this sense, the concept of moderation has arguably long been part of Malaysia's philosophy and agenda to promote social cohesion and national unity. However, and Malaysia is not alone in this, we have to acknowledge that society is becoming more polarized and Malaysia faces a tough balancing act in meeting the diverse and dynamic needs of, and rights and values of its people. To discuss this very timely topic, Emeritus Professor Dr. Dr. Shah will provide a lecture from the perspective of the Constitution I think I do not need to repeat his background as his luminous background has been highlighted earlier in Emeritus Professor Dr. Dr. Shad's lecture today entitled Returning to the Constitution's Path of Moderation. I'm sure he will provide insights and ideas on how we can move forward as a nation and as a society for, through a better understanding of our supreme law, our document of destiny, the Federal Constitution of Malaysia. With that, I am extremely honored to invite Yang Berbahagia, Emeritus Professor Datuk Dr. Haji Shad Salim Faruqi to provide his lecture. Prof, you have about 40 minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Alizan and distinguished guests. Uh, could you just give us a minute to get the slide going? Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, may I begin by pointing out that our nation is undergoing several painful trials. Uh, first of all, the COVID catastrophe, 
the economic devastation and the endemic political instability. I will not dwell on these issues. Instead, I'll join you in fervent prayer that we succeed in converting adversity into opportunity for a happier, healthier, and more equitable society. I'm mindful that in four weeks time, the sun will rise on our 64th Mardeka and the 64th anniversary of our federal constitution. I wish therefore to pay tribute to our document of destiny and to embark on a journey of renewal on the constitution's forgotten path of moderation, compassion, and compromise. Uh, next slide. Let me begin by pointing out that the constitution is not just a legal document. It is linked with philosophy and politics. It has at, at its, as its backdrop the panorama of history, geography, economics, and culture more than other fields of law. A constitution reflects the dreams, demands, values, and vulnerabilities of the body politic. A constitution that will endure must not depart too far from the values, the spirit, and the social and economic needs of the people. At the same time, and herein lies the great challenge, a constitution must be idealistic, aspirational, and transformative. It must hitch itself to the stars. A constitution must contain within it seeds of change for a just new social order. It must balance continuity and stability with the need for social change or social engineering. Now in a fragmented and ethnically divided society as Malaya was in 1957 and even more so in 1963, the constitution must seek to weld people together into one common nationality, to build bridges where walls existed. That's why in 57 and 63, the constitution walked the middle path of compromise, moderation and accommodation between the special needs of the Malays, the natives of Sabah and Sarawak, and the legitimate interests of the minorities who made Malaya their one and only one abode. In a, in a country, if there are regions, states or provinces that exhibit significant differences from the rest of the country, then the constitution must recognize their uniqueness, accept legal pluralism and maintain unity in diversity by granting special autonomy to such regions. For this reason, the Federation of, when the Federation of Malaya merged with Sabah Sarawak in Singapore to constitute the new and vastly enlarged nation of Malaysia, the three new states were admitted on terms and conditions that were far more favorable than were offered to the peninsula states in 1957. People with knowledge of constitutional law will say that this is unusual because all states of the Federation must be equal. But Malaysia could not avoid what is often called asymmetrical federalism. And in other words, symmetry was not used in the matter of these two states. The issue of the special rights of Sabah and Sarawak is hardly a unique phenomenon. Quebec in Canada, Kashmir in India till August 2019, Aceh in Indonesia, Mindanao in the Philippines are beneficiaries of special asymmetrical constitutional arrangements. Uh, and I'm sure they can learn a great deal from the Malaysian experience. Now coming to peaceful coexistence. Till the end of the last century, Malaysia was an exemplar to the rest of the world, especially the Asian and African world on peaceful coexistence between the various races and religions. 
Malaya, later Malaysia taught the world how to achieve a balance between modernity and religion, democracy and development, market capitalism, but with some state control over the economy, nationalism and internationalism. We managed social engineering and social change peacefully and without a revolution, violence and instability. I do not wish to name the countries. I do not wish to hurt feelings. But in some countries, a large section of the population was expelled. In other countries, their properties were expropriated without compensation. But in Malaysia, unlike in Northern Ireland, Yugoslavia, Chechnya, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, Lebanon, Libya, Syria, Palestine, Yemen, Sri Lanka, Southern Philippines, Southern Thailand, Myanmar, and East Timor, we have had peace and prosperity, stability and fair degree of social harmony. No region, no race, no religion is at war with another or with the central uh, government. Though the actual, um, sorry, um, <laughs> there's something I'm missing on the slide. Uh, anyway, let me um, go to next, next slide, please. To some extent, this moderation and balance is owed to the pragmatism, flexibility, and give and take spirit of our federal constitution, our document of destiny, and many of our earlier leaders, including Dun Hussein On. Uh, next slide. All constitutions, in my view, are balancing acts. In Malaya, Later Malaysia, the competing demands and expectations of the Malays and the non-Malays, the rulers and the Rayat, the British and the Malayans, the people of Malaya and the people of the Borneo states had to be harmonized. Next. Though the actual drafting of the federal constitution was undertaken by the Reed Commission, the framework assumptions of our document of destiny were influenced by Malaya's historical experiences, beginning with Dato Sar On bin Dato Jafar's struggles for independence and the craft of Tunku Abdurrahman, Abapa Malaysia, of welding together the major races under one multiracial alliance. Now, this presentation will examine the extent to which our constitution supplies a legal foundation for moderation, tolerance, harmony, and national unity. My humble submission is that even in its ethnic clauses, the constitution reflects a remarkable spirit of compromise, compassion, and moderation. And that is one of our forefathers' proud legacies to this nation. Legacy partly forgotten, not understood, and not honored. Uh, let me now go on to the constitutional basis for national unity. Despite many weaknesses and imperfections, certainly there are many flaws in the laws. Nevertheless, our constitution sought to provide a workable arrangement for the people of our multi-hued nation to live together in peace and harmony. In recognition of the fact that for centuries before Mardeka, Malaya was the land of the Malays. The poverty and underdevelopment amongst the Malays was very pronounced. The due to discriminatory colonial policies on education, economic development, and import of labor, they developed an undesirable identification of race with function. And due to the fact that the struggle for independence was initiated and waged vigorously, by several Malay organizations with the cooperation of non-Malay counterparts. The Mardeka constitution incorporated a number of features indigenous to the Malay archipelago. Prominent among these were the following. Sultanate. The Malay Sultanate was preserved but transformed to a constitutional monarchy. The system has worked well at the federal level and in most of the states. Islam. 
despite the opposition from the Reed Commission and from some states of the Federation, surprisingly. Tunku Abdul Rahman insisted that Islam be adopted as the religion of the Federation, but with freedom to other communities to practice their religion in peace and harmony. However, Article 3, Clause 1 on Islam was accompanied by Article 3, Clause 4. Article 3, Clause 4 reads, Nothing in this article derogates from any other provision of the Constitution, implying thereby that though Islam is the religion of the Federation, no institution, no law, no right, no duty, no procedure is invalidated because of Article 3, Clause 1. Uh, Sharia laws. Schedule 9 provides for the existence of Sharia laws and Sharia courts to deal with matters of Islam. However, I have to clarify a misunderstanding here. The Sharia applies, does not apply across the board. It applies only in 24 areas enumerated in the Constitution's ninth schedule, list two, paragraph one. Sharia law does not apply in areas assigned to the federal list or covered by federal law. Recently, uh, we had a case of Iki Putra, where actually a Selangor Sharia law sought to prosecute a few Muslims for carnal intercourse against the order of nature, homosexuality. Uh, the defendants argued that the offense is a federal offense. As such, the Sharia courts have no power to prosecute. And the federal court in a celebrated decision agreed that carnal intercourse against the order of nature is a federal offense and must be prosecuted in federal courts under Section 377A. The court did not say that homosexuality is a fundamental right, did not say that. It simply said that Islam applies only in enumerated areas. In other areas, federal law reigns supreme. There is a clear provision that Sharia courts shall have no jurisdiction over non-Muslims. Uh, next slide. Malay special position. The historical tradition of a special position for the Malays that existed during the British times. Uh, and in 1963, the rights of the natives of Sabah and Sarawak was continued in Article 153. The Reed, Rec Reed Commission's recommendation of a 15 year time limit for Article 153 was rejected by Tunku and his alliance partners. Malay reserves were recognized by the constitution. Bahasa Malayu in Rumi was entrenched as the official language for all official purposes, but with freedom to other communities to preserve their languages and to use them for non-official purposes. In fact, the constitution goes so far as to say the federal and state government may take action to preserve the language of other communities. So not only other communities may preserve their language, the government may take action to preserve their languages. Customary laws, special protection for the customary laws of the Malays and native law in Sabah and Sarawak exists even in times of emergency. Next slide. Rural weightage during elections. There is weightage for rural areas, which are predominantly Malay, in the drawing up of electoral boundaries. State posts, the historical reservation of some top posts in the state executive for Malays in the nine states with Malay rulers was continued. Preaching of religion to Muslims was regulated. This is an issue with public order implications and therefore legal restrictions are permitted on preaching of any faiths to Muslims under Article 11, Clause 4. The restriction applies to all persons, whether Muslim or non-Muslim. It is sometimes misunderstood that Article 11, Clause 4 was basically meant to prevent 
non-Muslims from preaching to Muslims. No, uh, uh, Article 11, Clause 4 is broader. No preaching of religion, any religion, is permitted except with the permission of the authorities. Muslim apostasy is subject to procedural uh, restrictions. Uh, next slide. Uh, protection for non-Muslims. The Malay Muslim features in the constitution are balanced by other provisions suitable for a multiracial and multi-religious society. The constitution is replete with safeguards for the interest of other communities. Notable features are as follows. Citizenship rights, which exist irrespective of race or religion or region. Uh, next. Electoral process permits all communities an equal right to vote and to seek elective office in federal at state levels. Race and religion are irrelevant in the operation of the electoral process. Fundamental rights, articles 5 to 13, are generally available to all persons irrespective of uh, race or religion. Next slide. Federal posts. At the federal level, membership of the judiciary, the cabinet of ministers, parliament, federal public services and special commissions under the constitution are open to all irrespective of race, religion or gender. All this talk that we hear that some top posts are reserved for a particular race is popular politics and has nothing whatsoever to do with our federal constitution. Education is free at the primary and secondary levels and is open to all irrespective of race or religion. However, post-secondary education is subjected to some quotas. To open up educational opportunities for non-Malays, Private schools, colleges, and universities, both national and international, are allowed. Foreign education is available to whoever wishes to seek it. Next. Financial assistance for education, government education, scholarships, and loans are given to many non malays though this is an area where a large discontent has developed over the proportions allocated. Even during a state of emergency under Article 150, some rights of Malays as well as non-Malays cannot be touched. Even during an emergency, citizenship, religion, all religions, language, all languages, they are protected by Article 150, Clause 6A against easy repeal or tinkering during an emergency. Saba and Saravak's special rights are safeguarded. The spirit of give and take between the races, regions, and religions is specially applicable in relation to Sabah and Sarawak. These states enjoy special legislative, executive, judicial, and financial powers in Schedule 9. 89 articles of the Constitution were amended in 1963 to cater to our enlarged federation. I acknowledge that a lot of discontent has arisen lately. But this is not the fault of the Constitution, but a lack of fidelity to the spirit of the Basic Charter and to faulty implementation. Next one. Constitutional supremacy. Though Islam is the religion of the Federation, Malaysia is not an Islamic state. The Constitution is supreme. The Sharia does not override the Constitution. The Sharia does not supply the litmus test of validity of a law. If you had a famous case, Che Omar Che So versus the public prosecutor. He challenged the validity of a drug law on the ground that the drug law has a number of presumptions which are un-Islamic in Islamic criminal jurisprudence. Islamic law has uh, a rich array of criminal laws. In Islamic law, there is no presumption of guilt. But in our drug laws, there is a presumption of guilt. So the law was challenged on the ground that it is un-Islamic. The court said the criterion of validity is the constitution. 
the Sharia does not supply the litmus test of validity. Religious freedom, the Sharia does not apply to non-Muslims. All religious communities are allowed to profess and practice their faiths in peace and harmony. Every religious group has the right to establish and maintain religious institutions for the education of its children. Next slide. Vernacular languages. Dobhasa Malayu is the national language for all official purposes. There is protection by law for the formal study in all schools of other languages. If 15 or more children so desire, that's what the Education Act says. There is statutory protection for the existence of vernacular schools and legal permission to use other languages for non-official purposes. Malay reserves exist, but it is also provided that no non-Malay land shall be appropriated for Malay reserves and that if any land is reserved for Malay reservations, an equivalent amount of land shall be opened up for non-Malays. Next. Article 153 on the special position of Malays is hedged in by a number of limitations not so well known. First of all, along with his duty to protect the Malays and the natives of Sabah and Sarawak, the king is also enjoined to safeguard the legitimate interest of the other communities. The special position of the Malays applies only in the public sector, not in the private sector. It applies in only four prescribed sectors and services, not across the board. Licenses and permits, civil service positions, post-secondary education, scholarship and education facilities. In these four sectors, the young Dipertonagong may reserve such proportions as may be necessary and as he may deem reasonable. The use of the words proportion implies that monopoly or exclusivity was not contemplated by the constitution. Next slide. In the operation of Article 153, no non-Malay or his heir should be deprived of what he already has. The constitution says that. No business or profession can be exclusively assigned to any race. The constitution says that. No ethnic monopoly is permitted. Article 153 does not override Article 136. Article 136 says, in the public service, there shall be no discrimination on grounds of race. So the implication is, reading 153 and 136 together, quotas and reservations are permitted at entry point. But once a person is in the public service, he should be treated equally. Though there is no time limit, for Article 153 reservations, the Constitution allows the YDPA to exercise his functions, Yang Dipartonagong, YDPA, to exercise his function in such manner as may be necessary. Next slide. The Article 153 is indeed entrenched. It's not easy to amend. Uh, policies under it are not carved out in granite and are open to review on concepts of necessity, reasonableness, and equity. Now, our legal system creates the conditions in which a dazzlingly diverse people can live together in peace, prosperity, and harmony. In our legal system, unity does not mean uniformity. Among the remarkable features our past leaders adopted were the following. The various communities were allowed to maintain their distinct, distinct ethnic identities, cultures, religions, languages, lifestyles, dresses, foods, music, vernacular schools. In some other societies, you can't have your ethnic names. You have to adopt more national names. But in Malaysia, all this is allowed. Culturally, the country is a rich mosaic, barring a short period after 69, when ethnic practices like lion dances were not permitted and forced integration was experimented with. The overall effort of the last 62 post-independence plus two pre-Mardeka years has been to find 
some areas of cooperation and to allow distinctiveness in other spheres of existence. Next. Secularism and religion live side by side. Mosques and temples and churches dot the landscape. Despite the prohibitions for Muslims, non-Muslims are not forbidden from taking alcohol, have gambling permits, rear pigs, pig farms, and dress in their own ways or the ways of the West. Political parties, businesses, and cultural associations are allowed to be organized on ethnic or religious lines, so much so that Malaya, later Malaysia, began its tryst with destiny, looking a little bit like the colors of a rainbow, in which the colors are separate, but not apart. Next. Some success has indeed been achieved to discover that which unites us and to tolerate that which divides us. It was earlier pointed out how during the COVID-19 crisis, people, many people have actually reached out to other communities in a transcendental spirit of love and tolerance that cuts across race and religion. Some time ago, actually, some time ago, we scored fairly well on the World Peace Index, being ranked 19 out of 153 states evaluated in terms of being very high in, in terms of uh, um, peace and harmony. Sadly, there are dark clouds over the horizon and racism and religious bigotry are becoming mainstream. Part of the problem also is that we are an emerging democracy. And as, as democracy emerges, people exercise free speech, often not very responsibly. Internet and the social media has made the problem worse. Uh, Internet gives wings to hate speech. Um, and uh, many people basically um, 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 use Internet to spread venom. Uh, next slide. In addition to the legal provisions in our constitution, the rainbow coalition that ruled the country for the last 62 plus two years, since 2020, uh, uh, the coalition is predominantly um, uh, monoethnic, but for 62 plus two years before Mardeka, uh, we had a politics of accommodation. There was an overwhelming spirit of accommodation between the races a moderateness of spirit and an absence of the kind of passion, zeal, and ideological convictions that in other plural societies have left a heritage of bitterness. Next, we use the economy to unite the people. I just want to mention this to Tuan Harizal. I once went to um, Bosnia on uh, in some um, official uh, assignment. And one of the things the Bosnian vice president told me is, he said, Malaysia has used the economy to unite the people. And I was very proud to hear that, that in the commercial and economic area, um, there is encouragement to the non-Malay dominated private sector to invest in the economy, to work with the public sector. There is freedom to import and export, to transfer funds and in general, there are economic opportunities to given to everyone, and therefore everyone has a stake in the country. The non-Malay contribution to the building of the economic infrastructure of the country is indeed significant and has given the country prosperity as well as stability. Next slide. Sadly, we have suffered a regression um, and uh, uh, in many corners of the world, walls of separation are being dismantled. Sadly, in our society, these walls are being fortified. Next. Uh, so what can be done? I want to uh, talk first of all about what the government can do. And secondly, what you and I can do. I'll take about uh, three minutes for uh, this and two minutes for what you and I can do. What can be done to strengthen our social fabric, strengthen our ethnic bridges, dismantle ethnic walls, heal and reconcile 
and develop a vision of unity. As we celebrate, I apologize, 64 years of political freedom, we need to restore moderation, recapture the spirit of 57 and 63, and reintroduce our winning formula for living together. The task is very large and holistic. Only a few proposals can be mentioned. First of all, we must recognize diversity as an asset. All members of the political, executive and public services and all members of society need to come to terms with our diversity, heterogeneity, pluralism and multiculturalism. This diversity is here to stay. It's not going to go away. In fact, the global trend is um, that there is a global village now. Um, in a few decades, there may be global citizenship. So we should regard diversity as an asset despite its many challenges. Next, we should improve constitutional literacy. If we read about the making of the constitution, we'll see that by far and large, the forefathers of our constitution were animated by a remarkable vision and optimism of a shared destiny. Uh, next one. Uh, our forefathers gave to every community a stake in the nation. No group received an absolute monopoly of power or wealth. Every community received something to relish and to cherish. Pluralism was accepted as a way of life and the unity that was sought was a unity in diversity. Next. I believe that the lack of familiarity with the basic charters provisions even within the top echelons of the civil service, the police, parliamentarians and politicians is contributing to the present state of unease. And on this point, I have already uh, mentioned and Tuan Harizal has accepted. I'll be very happy to remain associated with uh, ISIS for any short term course for uh, um, the foreign ministry, for the home ministry or um, for foreign embassies to familiarize people with the glittering generalities of our, uh, of our fundamental law. I think we can restore the spirit of 57 and 63. If we have to go forward as a United Nation, we need to go back to the spirit of moderation, accommodation and compassion that animated the body politic in the earlier decades. Next. Our secondary schools and universities must have a familiariz familiarization course on the basic features of our constitution and the reasons for the many delicate compromises contained therein. There are no ideal constitutional documents. Every constitution is sui generis, a class by itself. Um, so I think we need to point this out. Knowledge of the constitution is also a prerequisite to good citizenship and such knowledge, I think, will help to moderate extremism and to give appreciation of what I believe is one of the world's most unique and hitherto successful experiment in peaceful coexistence. Next, we should provide a new statutory institutional framework for reconciling race and religious conflicts. A new National Harmony Act, or you can call it a Race and Religious Relations Act or a Maintenance of Religious Harmony Act. I don't want to call it um, 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 by a negative name of Hate Speech Act. Um, no, I want it more positive, National Harmony Act, Maintenance of Religious Harmony Act. I think this should be drafted after wide consultation. An Equal Opportunities Commission was in fact proposed by the National Economic Advisory Council in its report entitled New Economic Model for Malaysia 2010. All in all, the National Harmony Act should have a triple purpose. Next, first, to administer cautions and warnings whenever peace is poisoned by hate speech or actions. There is no need to criminalize everything and to use the criminal law as uh, the first and last resort. 
first of all administer cautions and warnings second an educational aim to try to bring the parties together through education and conciliation to this end a community mediation council could be set up singapore offers such an example third to impose sanctions as a matter of last resort when conciliation fails and even when sanctions are imposed they need not be custodial community service injunctions and damages may be better alternatives next the national unity council should be upgraded to a statutory basis much like the race relations boards of the uk race relations training should be part of the agenda next we must promote interfaith studies i know many people have reservations about this i personally believe that most prejudices are born out of ignorance with greater knowledge and understanding we learn that it is not differences that cause disunity it is intolerance of differences that lead to disunity and violence we have to teach people that the primitive ethic of tribalism racism or religious exclusiveness has no place in modern society the circle of life has expanded we are all brothers and sisters on this big blue marble next our educational system must be revamped if young people do not learn together how will they live together the ethnic diversity of school teachers and school principals must be restored we must use school sports as a uniting force next role of malay rulers their majesties are protectors and defenders of all of their subjects they can do much to promote moderation nip extremism in the bud and to build bridges of understanding we note with gratitude the positive role played by the rulers of johor perak perlis and negri sembilan and perhaps many other rulers i just know uh, took note a few days ago the sultan of johor reprimanded someone who was giving aid uh, uh, on grounds of religion or race and the johor sultan reprimanded him uh, may i also point out the majlis raja raja is authorized by article 38 clause 2 to deliberate on any matter that it thinks fit i think they should deliberate on the state of our national unity and to advise the government on what can be done next um it'll be good to have along with the rukun nagara a declaration on religious and racial harmony uh, which may act uh, which may have a normative influence on citizens uh, hate speech uh, is already criminalized in the penal code communications and multimedia act printing presses and publications act sedition act perhaps it needs to be buttressed by a national harmony act or perhaps the problem is inadequate enforcement i think the laws are there the laws are plenty i think the problem is inadequate and unequal enforcement next we need to learn from others many societies including singapore uk usa are using the law to socially engineer a more tolerant society i think there's no shame in emulating emulating others and building our garland with flowers from many gardens next what can you and i do i'll just take uh, about 3 minutes here you must recognize that our cultures are intermingled and interdependent for centuries Malay, Chinese, Indian, Indonesian, Thai, Kazakhstan, Dusun, Iban, European cultures have mixed in our soil to constitute a rich cultural mosaic. The problem is many of us are in denial. Actually, there is far more cross-cultural mingling, sharing and co-dependence among us than we care to recognize, admit or celebrate. My good friend Patrick Pille says that um uh, and i i want to repeat i think the rivers of our life have been fed by streams from many many cultures and civilizations once we recognize that we can begin to regard the other 
as a close or distant cousin. Next. Fellow citizens, as fellow citizens, we must build bridges, not walls for healing and reconciliation and for developing a vision of uh, unity. We must distinguish racism from race consciousness. Racism is hatred for others and a desire to keep them down. Race consciousness is something positive. It involves a desire to help the upliftment of a community, not necessarily our own. For example, uh, we could work for the upliftment of the Orang Asli, and that's not uh, racism, but that could be uh, a race consciousness. Now, if we all um, uh, um, um, distinguish between racism and uh, racial consciousness, uh, then I think that would make a difference. There is no need to try to bring others down. There's no need to clip their wings. Our success should not be determined by the failure of others. Uh, next one, constitutional literacy. We must familiarize ourselves with the Constitution's carefully crafted clauses on ethnic compromises. Um, my uh, good friend Dr. Denison says, we must acknowledge and develop multiple identities. Actually, all of us stand at the center of a large number of circles of loyalty. Loyalty to race, to religion, to gender, to profession, to workplace, to neighborhood, to clubs, to hobbies, etc. If we could develop our multiple identities, this will help to build relationships which transcend race and religion. There is no need to reduce everything, every issue uh, to a race issue and to see every issue through the ethnic lens. We need to adopt moderation as a way of life. We must recognize human rights for all, not only for ourselves. May I say this as a student of constitutional law, the first function of freedom should be to free someone else. We must welcome social engagement with others while venerating our religion. We must not condemn other faiths. Please distinguish between the faith and the faithful. Do not stereotype any race or religion because in every race and in every religion there are wonderful people whose hearts are filled with love and compassion. We must be the change we wish to see in the world. Finally, let me end with the words of advice from the former Secretary General of the UN, Kofi Annan. The last slide, please. As we walk through the meadows of our mind, let us confront ignorance with knowledge, bigotry with tolerance, and isolation with the outstretched hand of generosity. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you, Professor Emeritus Dr. Dr. Shah, for providing us with an inspiring lecture. I think all of you can agree in your usual eloquent manner. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. We Thank covered you. a lot of ground, um, of, of, um, including areas of ethics, including linking it to the economy and so on. And you provide a nuanced view in terms of the complexity, both in terms of the design and making of the constitution, as well as its interpretation and implementation. In particular, you provided further understanding on the spirit of the constitution itself that was designed to be flexible, pragmatic, and therefore moderate, and how it is important for us to enhance our constitutional uh, literacy to interpret uh, the spirit that it was intended to be. Okay, we will now move on to the Q&A segment. I would like to invite my co-moderator, Ms. Tashni Sukmaran, to moderate the Q&A. Uh, Tashni, uh, you have uh, Hello, hi. Hey, thank you, Alizan. Um, and thanks, Prof. Shah. That was actually a really enlightening talk. I enjoyed that. And it really struck me uh, how you describe yourself as a student of the Constitution. It's such uh, a humbling thing to hear someone like 
as as venerators yourself describe it that way because it underlines that we're all students trying to of course of course yeah yes. <laughs> yes. and that you know none of us have all the answers and we have to forge ahead and find these answers together now um i'm going to go straight to the questions uh your friend and um estimable denison jayasuri has asked a question or well, two and uh here they are and first one is that he's he's talked about your proposals and your recommendations on laws to control hate speech and for community moderation and that sort of thing uh so he said these suggestions have been made but there seems to be resistance uh by uh politicians regardless of which side of the divide they're from so how can we all take this agenda further his second question um is that is on constitutional literacy what can we do to enhance constitutional literacy, especially among not just lawmakers in parliament, but also senior civil servants, so that they not just have a clear understanding of this document, but also promote it as a, as a way of life rather than just a statute? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tashni, and uh, uh, Dr. Denison. On the issue of hate speech, uh, Dato, actually, I personally feel there is no shortage of laws to regulate hate speech, from the Penal Code to the Sedition Act, to the Multimedia Act, there are plenty of laws. Ultimately, the issue is of um, equal and effective enforcement. I know many people want a hate speech law. I am not very much in favor of passing more and more laws and not implementing them. I think it is not the severity of the punishment. It is the surety of enforcement that makes the difference. Now, um, to me, the major issue uh, that here is that the Denison major issue is unequal enforcement of the law. However, something can be done. I think our leaders should speak, speak up and speak out whenever poisonous speech uh, spoils the atmosphere of the country. I think they should be vocal about it and say that's not allowed. So I, I just want to, um, it's not about hate speech, but I let me give the example, uh, I think last year or year before, where laundromat unto orang Islam sahaja. The ruler of Johor said that is not proper in the state of Johor. In uh, a northern state also, I think, in Perlis, the royal family took a stand against that. That's what I mean. Uh, the police everywhere in the world is overburdened. Everywhere in the world, there is unequal enforcement of the law uh, against the rich and the poor. Uh, Sometimes there are ethnic uh, problems also. I mean, uh, the USA is a clear example. If you look at the data of how many people are arrested, uh, how many people are charged, how many are sentenced to death, clearly there is uh, ethnic problems. But I think what is necessary is those in positions of authority moral authority, political authority, religious leaders, they must spread the right message. I mean, I am not qualified to speak about religion. I don't have a ta'ulia, but as a Muslim, I take note of the Holy Quran, which says, and insult not those who invoke other than Allah, lest they should insult Allah wrongfully without knowledge. This is the Surah 6, Ayat 108. So even those who are not belonging to your religion, don't insult them. And the Holy Quran also says, I do not argue with the people of the scripture, except in a way that is best. Surah 29, Ayat 46. I think our religious leaders must take a stand against religious bigotry, against religious hatred against hate speech. So religious leaders, political leaders, and you and I, I think we all have a duty to take a stand. I 
I have to say this. I think if one person stands up and says, I think that's wrong. That may have a ripple effect in the sense that you throw a stone on a placid lake, the ripples go far. Others may be encouraged to say, hey, wait a minute, that is wrong. So that's why I have no simple solution except to say there should be equal enforcement. And I think politicians, especially religious leaders and the royalty, they should speak against um, hate speech. Now, as to constitutional literacy, um, that uh, when the Human Rights Commission was created in 1999, at that time itself, we approached the ministry to say, can we have a small course in human rights? Not the entire constitution, but human rights. Uh, the ministry is a little bit reluctant because they say the students are overburdened. Indeed, they are. Syllabus is overloaded. Nevertheless, I, I think um, the constitution should be taught at the secondary level. It should be taught uh, to civil servants. Uh, the kind of uh, briefing they get on the constitution, uh, a few charts, a few circles, executive, legislative, judiciary, I don't think that's enough. I think we need to train our parliamentarians. We need to train uh, civil servants. Uh, we need to train university students uh, in the constitution, especially those provisions of the constitution which deal with uh, ethnic relations. Uh, short courses, which uh, uh, Tuan Harizal has in mind, they would achieve the purpose. And that's why I apologize. Uh, I also apologize, Tashni, to you. Uh, I, I'm not trying to boast, but uh, since 1992, I've been writing columns. That's, that's 30 years, 30 years. For 30 years, I've been writing columns in the Star or at one time in the Sun, at one time in the New Straight Times, actually, I was writing columns on the Constitution. And uh, I want you to know this. Uh, and I'm not saying that with any sense of uh, anger. Uh, in the university setting, many of my colleagues look down on that. Why should you write for the newspaper? You should write for the Harvard Law Journal. You should write for the Hong Kong Law Review. But my aim is to promote constitutional literacy, to take it to as many homes and as many hearts as possible. The Raya doesn't read the Harvard Law Journal. <laughs> so that's why actually I go for I go for popular columns. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rizal. You mentioned that um, uh, it is written in fairly simple language. I think that's my aim, and I hope uh, many more can join in in this task. Thank you. Thank you, Tashni. Thanks, Prof. Shad. Okay. The questions are really rolling in. There's some tough ones coming up. I hope you're ready. Um, so Noor Hakib here has asked about one art, Article 153 and uh, how it provides for the legitimate interests of communities uh, like the special position of Malays and natives of Sabah and Sarawak. And um, he also mentions that you know 153 sub 2 and 153 sub 8a provide for the reservation in reasonable proportions for uh, things such as admission into tertiary education, scholarships, public service. So he's asking, what is the scope for the legitimate interest of other communities in 153? And could it also include vernacular schools? Sure. Uh, the constitution, if I may use the word, uh, contains glittering generalities, <laughs> uh, broad phrases. It just says legitimate interests of other communities. And that I think it's left to the government of the day to determine what these are. When it comes to, uh, when it comes to vernacular languages, not only Article 153, uh, I'm now referring to my copy of the Constitution and I'll read it out to you from there. My own credibility, um, Tashni, is not so high, but let me therefore read to you from the Constitution. It says 152, not just 153, Tashni, 152. 152 says, nothing in this article, nothing in this clause shall prejudice the right of the federal government 
or any state government to preserve and sustain the use and study of the language of any other community in the Federation. Look at that. The federal and state governments are not prevented from preserving and sustaining the use and the study of the language of any other community. The Constitution throughout actually sought to protect the interest of all communities. So I can't really give you a uh, uh, nicely cut uh, and dried definition of what is legitimate interest of other communities. I think it would change from time to time. Uh, the Perlembagan in 1957 could not possibly encompass post independence developments. Um, uh, Tashni, life is always larger than the law. No constitution can anticipate the problem that would arise. So I, I think uh, it's up to the up to the leadership. Okay, thank you. Listening to you speak, I'm actually really grateful that you write for us and not foreign publications behind a paywall, to be very frank. I've been reading your columns since I was in university, so that's some context. Um, if I may abuse my position as moderator just a little, uh, I'd like to ask you a question for myself, actually. You mentioned, you know, our dual legal system, you know, common law and Sharia law. Uh, there seem to be many stories and uh, academic papers and, and research uh, done on something called Sharia creep, which is sort of the increasing influence uh, Sharia law has on, on common law matters. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah. I, I'm sure that is true, um, and it's a two-way process. Uh, mm. Without doubt, many aspects of the Sharia had influenced the common law, but it is not fashionable to talk about that. I, I can just give you one example. For example, in Islam, Islamic land law, there is the concept of Iyya al-Mawat. Iyya is life. Uh, uh, Ma Mawat is what is dead. So you give Hayat, you give life to something that is dead. You have an equitable interest over it. In other words, if you revive dead land, if you revive mm. dead land, you have some interest over right? it. This yeah. was always known in Islamic law. Well, uh, uh, it, it, the common law in England began to recognize this. Um, um, uh, in Negri Sambilan, you have concept of Harta Sapancharian. Uh, in England, in the 60s, they began to recognize um, uh, uh, family assets. I think a concept quite similar. So I, 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 would, I would say this, uh, I, I would say this, uh, uh, Tashni, that all legal systems actually overlap with each other. No legal system has a monopoly of truth and equity and justice. And I think we should learn from each other. As I said in my presentation, we should build a garland with flowers from many gardens. And I think um, that would be necessary, not just for intercommunal harmony, but also because life changes, the law must change. Understood, thank you. Um, so this question is from Omar Harris in the audience, and he asks that, uh, well, he says it's fair to say that views and emotions on, on multiculturalism are often stoked and brandished as a tool by certain politicians for, for mileage. So how do we hold these uh, figures, these politicians or leaders or just uh, influencers to account in a meaningful and effective way if our own institutions fail to act against them? Yeah, without doubt, uh... Anywhere in the world, uh, um, uh, stoking racial and religious sentiment uh, is a profitable business, uh, politically speaking. Uh, it collects vote. I, I, I'm not a, 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 a Trump hater, not at all, but I think Mr. Trump proved that to us, that by uh, appealing to a narrow sector of the population, um, he can win a presidential election. And so much so, he can even actually uh, uh, try to 
uh, prevent the newly elected president uh, uh, two years ago from taking office. So everywhere in the world, whether it's in India or it's in the USA or it's in Myanmar or it's in Sri Lanka, uh, everywhere in the world there are politicians, Tashni, who hide in the gutters and who summon us to go and join them there. Now, this cannot be prevented. This is the dilemma of electoral democracy. In a democracy, you need votes. To get votes, you have to cater to the wishes and to the sentiments of those who are going to vote. So I, I'm afraid that this is the dilemma of democracy, that in a democracy, populist rather than populist opinion, rather than what ought to be. Um, I think that has to be taken note of. But the answer or the countervailing force is this, that there should be NGOs, there should be leaders, there should be citizens like you and me who are prepared to stand up and say, this is wrong. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm reminded of this beautiful sentence um, from Jesse Jackson. He said, leaders of substance do not follow opinion polls. They mold opinion, not with guns or dollars or position, but with the power of their souls. Um, um, in America, um, Lincoln tried to free the slaves, even though that was unpopular. And not only unpopular, it was economically suicidal for the southern plantations. But he nevertheless went on to free the slaves. Nehru in India adopted secularism, even though actually Hindu society, 80% of the population is Hindu. Hindu society is deeply, deeply religious. Um, same happened actually in uh, uh, Malaya, uh, that actually the forefathers of our independence and prime ministers, including uh, Prime Minister Dun uh, Hussein On, they actually tried to walk the middle path, e even though Malay nationalism uh, was very, very strong and still is very, very strong indeed. Right, thank you. Uh, I know these are these are big topics to try and cover in one short Q&A, so I really, really appreciate the effort you're putting in. Yeah. Um, I've got yeah. one more from, yes? Yeah, I just wanted to mention this uh, as sure. an afterthought. Um, issues of racism, religious bigotry, um, or secessionist movements and all. Uh, there are no simple answers to that. I think each one of us should make our opinion felt, uh, opinion known. And my hope is this, that ev even one person can make a difference. I, I like to give this example, you know, in the desert sometimes, Tashni, a sand dune will grow around a single blade of grass. What I mean is this, one, one opinion, one opinion can make a difference. So I think that's what we should do. Um, the politicians, well, they will always be politicians everywhere in the world. I think we should do what we can to stand up and say, this is wrong. I like to think Malaysia has a lot of people who do that. Oh like yes, we do. We and do. I think this COVID thing has demonstrated that. Yeah, yeah. There's a certain solidarity you're seeing from just the normal man on the street, woman on the street. Um, I'd like to take a question from my friend this time, Naufal. And he has a question regarding rule of law. So it is submitted that unchecked exercise of power by the institutions of government pose a threat to the rule of law. Uh, on that note, to what extent do the institutions of government um, stay successful or become successful in checking these exercises of power amongst them? Yeah. Uh, rule of law is against any arbitrary power. It should be limited government. The purpose of rule of law is not to cripple the government, but to control it. And how to achieve this balance between not imposing too many restraints and yet not giving them too much power is a challenge uh, that is a continuing one. Um, uh, there is no one way to uh, make the rule of law flower. Uh, let me just rattle out uh, 
the traditional institutions, judicial independence, supreme constitution, chapter on fundamental rights, federal state division of powers, a free press, freedom of assembly whereby people, association and assembly, whereby people will march and protest, whereby people will uh, form associations. And uh, um, all this, all these together can make a difference by itself. Each technique, each modality is inadequate. But put together, they constitute a torrent of pressure which cannot be resisted. Now, I, I know in this country, um, people will say, oh, the institutions are um, totally out of control. Um, the executive is supreme. That's not entirely so. Um, um, look at some of the NGO movements that arose over the last few decades. In, in my lifetime, and please don't start guessing my age now. <laughs> in my lifetime, the consumer movement arose. When it arose, it was condemned as anti-business. But now nobody will complain about uh, consumer responsibility. Uh, women's movement arose. Environmentalism is being talked about. Human rights are being talked about. So I, I think the government may take on a very uh, uh, adversarial stand to begin with. Ultimately, I think it makes an influence. Uh, it has an influence. Berse was able to bring about a lot of reforms. For example, uh, voting of those who are abroad mm -hmm. could be brought here. I think that was the contribution of Berse. So I think our country is receptive partly to human rights movements, to um, advocacy of the rule of law, judicial independence, etc. During the time of, uh, um, um, I think two or three prime ministers ago, 1999, Human Rights Commission was established. Um, a Judicial Appointments Commission was established. So I think it's not, it's not a totally negative picture. I think the rule of law is under stress, no doubt. But at the same time, there is much that's going for it. All right, thank you. Um, so someone in the audience, Revadi from Malaysian Insight has a question that I think we can link to constitutional literacy. It's about 150, uh, specifically 150 sub three, where um, it's about the emergency ordinances and the proclamation and uh, the lack of clarity on whether the YDPA was informed. Um, some lawmakers have said that not seeking the YDPA's approval is unconstitutional. So in the spirit of uh, educating us about the constitution, uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Under article 150 clause one, proclamation of emergency is issued by the young Di Parthonagong. I know he acts on advice, but ultimately his seal and signature is needed. Under article 150 clause 2b, ordinances are issued by the Yang Di Pratonagong, again on advice, but his seal and signature are needed. I would then say revocation of any of these would require the Yang Di Pratonagong's signature and seal. Now, whether this revocation was done by the Agong or not, I have no knowledge of that. But I will answer your question by saying, in general, the way you make a law is also the way you repeal the law. Repealing a law is also actually amounting to making or unmaking the law. So that is actually is a really yes. good yeah, rule of thumb to, for people to sort of operate by. That's a very nice way to put it. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is from the audience, uh, Nazran Zafri. He'd like to hear more about your thoughts regarding a possible National Harmony Act. He thinks it's a great idea but he's wondering if you have any further points on what specifics it would focus on and its impact on racial relations. And uh, do you think there's actual political will to debate and pass this act, you know, to make this law? 
Well, I, first of all, National Harmony Act, actually I did uh, cover three points about it. I apologize, I didn't make it so clear. Uh, first of all, um, the National Harmony Act should try to bring about conciliation. I think that should be the first job. If I used an insult against a religion, I should be required now to reach out to those who are insulted, to apologize to them and to clarify and to learn from what they say. Conciliation. I think that should be the first aim. Uh, maybe number two, uh, conciliation may not be easy unless you have a short course or uh, rehabilitation type of thing, but actually the person is required to attend a number of hours or a number of classes. And thirdly, if none of this succeeds, uh, then a criminal penalty, but the penalty need not be, as I said, uh, putting him in jail. Penalty could be community service. The penalty could be actually an injunction by the court. Penalty could be grant of damages. Uh, uh, so I, I, I think um, the National Harmony Act, there are many models available. Britain had a Race Relations Act 1976, as early as 76. They amended that later on. Singapore has one, many other countries have. There should be no problem in getting a blueprint from somewhere. But as to whether there is a political will, I, I want to say something to you very frankly. Um, personally speaking, I, I don't care about that. <laughs> I think we do what we have to do. We plant the seeds which may lead to the greening of the landscape of ideas. We throw the stone on the placid lake, hoping it will cause ripples. Whether it does or not, I'm not so sure. If I'm going to make a business-like decision, is my investment worth it? Then I think nothing worthwhile will be done. I know in business, you don't invest unless there is some chance of a good return. Now, but what needs to be done needs to be done and we should not worry about success i think we do what we have to do we do our best we leave the rest to god and i'm optimistic that some impact will be there thank you thank you yeah and i, I love your your comments on, on reconciliation i really enjoy hearing about you know restorative transformative justice as, as avenues to to remedy um, I have one, well, I have a couple more questions. This next one is from uh, someone who's declined to be named. They're asking about specifically societal standards of justice and how they've shifted. And they're ask, suggesting that perhaps all compromises, is it possible they are perpetuating, perpetuating inequalities? Has the constitution or certain parts of the constitution not grown with society? Yes, actually issues of justice can never remain static. Um, and uh, issues of justice are multidimensional. I just want to mention this uh, to you. For example, uh, in the last few years, many of us students of constitutional law are now beginning to talk of the rights of future generations. Uh, we haven't stopped talking about the rights of present generations. Now we are talking of the rights of future generations. Many people are saying a reasonable person should not only be concerned about his rights, but the rights of his children and children's children. We are talking of sustainable development. So I'm just trying to illustrate this point that notions of justice clearly have to be dynamic from time to time. So for example, internet, is causing a massive challenge to the rights of workers. Inter, inter, trade on internet is actually, uh, uh, in some respects, uh, workers' rights are being deeply, deeply infringed. Now coming to 153. Yes, indeed, 153 was a bold experiment in social engineering. The data in 1957 was very clear that the Malay community, which was in numbers numerically majority, 
in other many other criteria and it was far far behind tun sufyan in his book on the constitution um, clearly mentioned out of 100 students in the medical faculty um, uh, i think there were four only four four were malays now that kind of thing um, cannot be allowed um, to persist so surely social engineering was necessary by the way many other countries for example in the usa rosco pound the theory mm. of social engineering talks about reconciliation between conflicting interests with the least friction and waste so i think a a article 153 social engineering was entirely justified but not just for one race but for the legitimate interests of all other communities now has it worked obviously it has worked in some areas for example in education education has been given to uh, thousands and thousands of malays but in the economic area obviously article 153 leaves a lot to be desired so obviously we need new strategies perhaps what has happened is this and i'm not an economist what has happened is this that article 153's benefits have not reached the really poor the really needy and therefore mm -hmm. um what was meant as a social engineering as an affirmative action uh, matter has actually become a case of uh, people monopolizing the benefits of 153 for their own benefit so i think race needs to be replaced with need and i think in the last 5 or 10 years that issue is being talked about that right. we need to give scholarships and loans and assistance uh i think many of the policies many of the policies certainly need need revision uh and this will be the challenge of justice along with many other challenges of justice challenges, yeah absolutely justice has a lot on its plate it's, um <laughs> justice is a journey not a destination that is a nice image thank you um <laughs> So this one I am going to ask uh maybe somewhat presumptuously on behalf of some of the students in our audience who perhaps don't want to take to the question box and uh it's of course leaning on your on your tenure as a as a teacher educator if i wanted to become more literate with the constitution functionally and i was uh in high school or you know just entering college what are some of the things that i could do right off the bat to start because it can be a daunting document especially you know once you get past the first fundamental principles it becomes quite difficult and then you've got all the schedules and everything so yeah actually there are efforts by many people to simplify the constitution many years ago um, the bar council had a constitutional lit literacy sure. committee my consti and they produced small pamphlets i had the privilege of being involved in the background uh, uh with the preparation of those booklets um there are smaller books on the constitution simple books the simplest one is by tun mohammad sufyan an introduction to the constitution 1976 later on it was edited by my learned colleague saleh abbas and uh, his uh, other friends so it's the simplest book uh may i also point out to you uh there is a book that came out yes uh, i love that one yes. our constitution and tashni i'm happy to mention to you our constitution is coming out in bahasa malayu uh in a few months time inshallah god willing that is fantastic news okay well that is a great book i have read that and i'll pick up the other one you mentioned and i hope that the students who are tuning in do the same because uh it's better to start younger and and come out truly empowered and you can tell this student uh i'll be happy if he were to write to me on an email uh and i'll be very happy to reply uh the only condition is this that he should use normal language i don't understand the email language <laughs> it should be normal bahasa malayu or normal english all this cross this and that i don't understand that write to me <laughs> i will reply to you i'm a teacher 
and uh, uh, it's a privilege to be a teacher. Thank you very much. Well, on that note, I'd like to pass it back to our MC or to Mr. Alizan. Okay, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I think that's a very apt way to end the lecture. Prof. Leto, you certainly are a teacher to all of us, Leto, and today. <laughs> Thank you so much. Showed very brightly. Um, so we have come to the end of today's lecture on returning the constitution uh, path of moderation. Um, and again, I think many of you like myself who have been enlightened today, especially on matters regarding the constitution and especially uh, specifically related to multiculturalism, multiculturalism. Most importantly, it was very important to remind everyone, I think the spirit in the making of the constitution, which deliberately, very deliberately, as we show, sought a path of moderation, compassion and compromise. And I think quite importantly, you brought this notion that governance is not just government as well, that everyone has a role and responsibility to play in upholding the spirit, Indeed. as well as mentioned uh, that many, um, segments of society can act as countervailing forces, especially against more populist ideals. So in Prof Shah's words, it's down to us to build bridges, not walls. Um, and I think improving our constitutional literacy is a good starting point, especially in differentiating these more popular elements and the actual spirit and intention of the constitution. So at ISIS Malaysia, we hope to play our part in bringing these topics to influence public discourse and encourage debate and understanding. By the way, for those uh, who are interested in, in the book just launched, uh, you can access it in our website. Um, and so feel, please feel free to download a copy of, 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 um, uh, of the book just launched today. So with that, I would like to once again, thank you all for your active participation and providing very interesting questions that were posed. And of course, I would like to once again, thank Emeritus Professor Dato Dr. Haji Shad Salim Faruqi for his brilliant lecture today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's all from me. Thank you. And I will pass it back to the MC to close today's proceedings. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, uh, Mr. Alizan. Uh, thank you to our panelists for the session and to all our distinguished guests. Thank you for your participation. The program is coming to a close. Once again, we wish to convey our heartfelt gratitude to Yang Babahagia Dato' Muhammad Riza Ghazi for your kind attendance to gracefully deliver the remarks on behalf of the family of the late Tun Hussein On. Our utmost appreciation also goes to Yang Babahagia Datin Paduka Dr. Farida Abdullah, Chairman of the NOAA Foundation for your support. Uh, as mentioned, we wish to let you know that a digital copy of Professor Shah's book is available for download on ISIS Malaysia's website. We wish to also take this opportunity to invite you to ISIS Malaysia's signature event, the Asia Pacific Roundtable that will be held on August 17th to 18th. Do visit ISIS Malaysia's website for more details. Thank you once again, and we look forward to meeting you in the near future. Thank you.